Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining Hosokawa's webinar on NADA mixing and drying technologies. My name is Greg Boyer, and I'm the marketing manager for Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems. We hope you find today's presentation informative and enjoyable. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the question panel on the side of your screen to answer, ask your question. We'll answer as many questions throughout the presentation at the end as possible. At this time, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Chris Paulsworth, Hosokawa's expert on mixing and drying applications. Thanks for the kind introduction, Greg, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, we'll start with the table of contents, just a quick review of what's going to be discussed. We're going to start with an introduction of, to the mixers, um, break down how they work, review some of the components, talk about using it as a dryer, some common applications, and then finish with a question and answer session. So let's start at the beginning. The Nauta was patented in 1940. Uh, it was patented by Mr. Um, Johannes Edward Nauta. Um, he is the person who founded the Nauta Mix Company. Um, and the, the patent actually was for a mixing apparatus, especially adapted for the mixing of pulverized materials, which hopefully that relates to what you're looking for from these mixers. I'm going to read real quick the first introduction from the patent. So this invention relates to the mixing apparatus which is partially adapted for the mixing of part of pulverized materials such as flour and which comprom comprises a stationary mixing trough having an outlet opening for the mixed product at its lower end and being provided with a mixing screw which is driven in such a manner that the components of the trough are conveyed from the lower end to the upper end thereof and then fall back again in the mixing trough. So that is a very simple description of the Nauta mixer and it is the basis for everything that we'll be discussing today. So this is a picture of the original design that was submitted in the patent. As you can see, it's very similar to what we provide today in the Nauta mixer. Uh, it comprises a conical vessel with an auger. The auger is uh, actually driven by the bottom from the bottom in the old design, and then it has an orbital arm that's going to change the position of the auger within the vessel. Interestingly, in the patent, there was actually multiple, there was other designs that were submitted as well. So the other design includes a conical vessel and a cylindrical portion and includes an orbital, or excuse me, includes an auger that's split into sections. One thing to note is that for the Nauta design, the, um, the auger is parallel to the wall and they maintain that in this alternate design. So you split the the auger into two sections, a vertical section and then a slope section, always maintaining parallel with the wall. So throughout the year, this design has been improved. We have, um, you know, basically kept the same orientation, but improved it, uh, modernized the components, modernized the fabrication techniques used to produce the units, modernized our engineering. Um, we, pr we have the original design, but we produce a modern piece of equipment. Um, so over the years, um, sorry, uh, Hoskow, so I'm from Hoskow Micron and we are, you know, a global company, but this equipment was started in the Netherlands and is actually an accumulation of different companies. Um, Hoskow Micron licensed this equipment from uh, Nautimix starting in 1963, and then that company was actually acquired by Hoskow Micron in 1987. So we'll use the terms Nauta, Vrico Nauta, um, and some other terms, and these date to the original company in the Netherlands, um, but today we are Hoskow Micron. So let's get into the mixer itself. We'll start with talking about how mixers work. Mixing is a process about transporting particles. If you imagine you have particle A and particle B and they're completely segregated, to get to a mixed particle, what you wanna do, or to get to a mixed powder, what you wanna do is transport the particles within the batch. So you have particles that start over here in material A, you wanna put them into this side over here with material B, and then you want to move 
particles from this side of the batch over here until you get a random mixing over the side. So what you're really talking is you're talking about transporting the particles within the batch. Um, one other quick slide, I guess, real quick is uh, a lot of people ask why not a mixers? Um, not a mixers are good because they're a gentle mixer and they produce a high, um, a uh, very high quality mix. So if you go back to um, what you want the mix to look like, you want a completely random mixture. And this is something that the Nauta can produce. Um, it's a very gentle mixer, so it's not going to distort your product. And it's um, available in a, in a wide variety of sizes as well. So, okay. So going back to the mixer itself, that transport inside the batch is done by an auger. So the, what the auger does is the auger takes material from the bottom of the mixer and transports it to the top. Gravity is then going to take that material that's been pulled up to the top and transport it back down. So you're going to get a convection loop inside the mixer with the auger pulling material up and, the, and gravity pulling it back down. Now what this is going to do is this is going to randomize and you have kind of a controlled randomization. The auger is not an enclosed auger. So material can kind of get on the auger and get off the auger at different heights within the batch. So you're going to have material that's pulled from the bottom and transported up, but you're also going to have material that's going to enter um, maybe a third of the way up, two thirds of the way up, or even almost at the top. And this material is going to be pulled in and transported up up the auger and discharged at the top. Now what you also have, because you have material getting on the auger at different heights, you have material getting off the auger at different heights as well. So if all the material at the bottom, some of it is only going to get a quarter of the way up, some of it is going to get halfway up, some of it is going to get almost to the top, and some of it is going to get to the top of the batch. Now at the same time as you have material getting on and off the auger, you also have an, an auger that's being pushed around the batch by the orbital arm. So you have the auger rotating and the auger is angled down into the bottom of the mixer and it's pulling material up. Now, as it starts here, material is going to be getting off right at the bottom. But as it moves around, it's going to be moving up. The material is going to be getting off higher and higher within the batch, but it's also going to be getting off at a different spot within the mixer because this orbital arm is going to be rotating, changing the position of the auger. So you're kind of getting a controlled randomization inside the batch. You're taking material from the bottom, or I guess from the entire batch, and moving it to other places within the batch. So this is about teamwork. You have an auger and an orbital arm that work together. Combined, they're going to give you a tip speed of about 1, 1 to 1 1.2 meters per second. Um, that's a relatively low tip speed for a mixer. Um, you you know, for low shear mixers, you're going to see speeds in this in this range. High shear, maybe five meters per second, or excuse me, mid shear might be five meters per second. High shear might be 10, 20 meters per second. So this is a very low tip speed. And that tip speed, actually, what, what gives you this speed is it's the speed at the top flight auger from the rotation of the auger itself and the orbital arm that's driving that auger around. Now, if the red shows you the speed from the auger, you can see that that's going to be constant across the whole height within the batch. But at the top of the top of the batch, you're going to get a much bigger component from the orbital arm. But however, you can see that combining them two, the speed that's generated from the auger is still going to be more a larger component when compared to the orbital arm. Now, like I said, they're working together. Um, in general, the auger does more work than the orbital arm. And this is shown out by the fact that in, in general, I'm going to keep saying that because I'm you know, talking about the entire range of mixers. And obviously, there's some variation. Uh, but in general, you're going to see a 10 to 1 ratio of the motor sizes. So the auger is going to be 10 times the, the motor that drives the auger is going to be 10 times more powerful than the auger that drives the orbital arm. You know, for example, 10 to 1 horsepower. Um, why that is, is that the auger actually clears the path for itself. So you have a lot of motion in the area right around the auger. You have material entering and leaving as it's 
as it's pulling material up, you know, you have material getting on and off, on and off, and on and off at all these different heights. And that's kind of generating a moving bed of powder. Now you're not moving very fast. It's, it's just a little bit of movement, but that little bit of movement frees up the space for the orbital arm to push the auger through the batch. So you're not dragging the auger through the batch. It's kind of flowing through the batch because right in its path, right before where it goes, you have kind of a, a, a moving bed of powder. And it's much easier to push that auger through a moving bed of powder than it is to push the auger through a stationary bed of, bed of powder. Now this also has some other effects in that, for instance, you have to keep the auger speed above a certain point. So if you, for instance, lower the auger speed too much and you try to push that that auger through the batch by the orbital arm what'll happen is that you'll actually draw too much power and you'll overload the motor um you know we do that in a way such that um if you look at this arm it's a long it's basically a long um you know like a long cantilever unit and you don't want to put too much force on it because you don't want to deflect it. You want it to really flow and slide through that batch really gently. And that way you can take that powder, you know, from one portion and, and move it somewhere else very easily. So looking at filling the mixer, um, in general, when we refer to the volume of a mixer, it's really easy to give the water fill capacity. So if you imagine a mixer, you have a conical vessel, you fill it up with water, and that's going to give you the water filling capacity. It's a flat line on the top. However, powders, when they're being mixed, you're not going to get a flat surface on the top. The auger is going to pull the material up the side, and you're going to get a sloped angle at the top. This slope is going to be different for all different powders. So if you have a powder with a very high angle, excuse me, high angle of repose, or a powder, for instance, that's cohesive and not very free flowing, you're going to get a very steep angle here. And your effective capacity could actually be less than you would if you had a mix, a mix with a very low angle of repose or, you know, it's very free flowing powder. So in general, what we say is that the mixing capacity at, on the upper end is 85% of the water fill volume. Now, one of the things about these mixers is that you can underfill them and still get good mixing quality. So if you wanted to, you can <laughs> fill in 50% of the vessel, turn it on, and still get a good mix. However, there is a lower limit to that. And the lower limit is that you need to fill above the bottom two flights of the screw to get good mixing quality. So for instance, here's one flight and here's two flights. If you wanted to fill this mixer to its lower capacity, you would have to fill up above these two flights. And in general, that tends to be about 15% of the water fill volume. So for these mixers, your mixer capacity is gonna be 85 to 15% of the water fill volume. What I'm gonna show you now is a a video of mixing and some of you guys have seen this uh, it's from our YouTube page Act. sorry about that some technical issues we may have overextended ourselves a little bit trying to bring in a video but um, we do have uh, just leave it just leave it we do have a video of mixing um, that's pretty good that's up on our um, up on our YouTube channel and if you want you can go there and um, you know we we have some more resources there as well so I'm going to continue on with the presentation um, looking at the so you have a general idea about how the mixer works. Now we're going to go into the different components that make up the mixer. Um, the vessel itself is a conical vessel. The angle is 34 degrees from side to side. So from this wall to this wall, you have 34 degrees. And that's going to be um, 17 degrees from vertical. Now you can, you can figure out, based on the, um, based on the formula, how to relate the height and the volume, and you can um, find out the proportionality, and it tends to be that the volume is proportional to the height cubed. Um, if you, for instance, apply that, you can find out that if you double the height, you're gonna get eight times the volume, and in practice, you're gonna get eight to 10 times more volume if you double the height of the mixer. Now, what's happening here is that you're adding volume onto this batch up at its widest portion. So if you have a green size mixer, say this triangle, and you want to and you make it bigger, 
what you're do is what you're doing is adding slabs of material onto the mixer at its widest point. So you can add a lot more volume by making the mixer just a little bit taller. So attached to that conical vessel is the top cover. There's three types of top covers that we manufacture. The most basic type is a flat cover. So you have your conical wall here and you just have a flat cover. Um, this is the, just the general uh, type of mixer. Um, it's very common um, and it's, it's used everywhere. Um, above that, you have a semi-domed cover. Now what the semi-domed cover does is it gives you a curved angle right here. And this curve actually makes cleaning much easier. If you imagine with the flat top cover, material can get stuck in this little crevice and then it can be very hard to clean out. With the semi-domed cover, you can spray this area out with a cleaning device and it's gonna, um, it's gonna be much, much more um, easy to clean, much less carryover from batch to batch. Above that, we have a domed cover. The domed cover is used for pressure vessels. So if you wanted a vessel to be able to pull vacuum or apply positive pressure, you're probably gonna have to go, well, you can do low pressure with these as well, um, but if you wanted to go to higher pressures, you're gonna have to go for a domed cover, and this dome shape uh, just makes it suitable for pressures. Um, on top of that top cover is the drive. Now what the drive does is the drive, you know, it provides the energy um, into the orbital arm and into the auger to pull the material up from the bottom. Now, if you think about it as kind of Lego pieces, what you do is you take the, take the vessel for the batch size, and then you take the drive based on the batch weight. So you kind of fit those two components together to give you a mixer. So what you can see here is we actually make this, mix, this mixer with this drive size, which would be our 44 drive size, and it can actually fit onto a wide variety of vessels. And what you're doing here is if, say, you have a very heavy batch of material, um, you're going to need a certain drive size uh, to, to associate that batch weight. But what you can also have is you can have a batch with the same weight, but much more volume because it's much less dense powder. And because of that, you can have the same drive size on a large, large vessel. So there's kind of a component selection you know, thing going on where you have to consider both your batch weight and your batch volume and combine them together to get the mixer that's going to be required. Um, looking at the orbital arm, there's actually two types of orbital arm that we make. Um, they're, they're selected based on the driving type. So our standard orbital arm is round and it has gear drive. So what you have is you have a shaft in the middle and you have bearings and then you have gears here, here, and here and here, oh, excuse me, here and here. And those gears are gonna provide the energy and the movement and you know drive that auger and move that orbital arm. Um, what we make for pharmaceutical applications is we actually make a belt drive. So the belt drive has a belt and that belt goes down that orbital arm and it actually drives the auger. And the belt is used because there's no lubricants in it. So there's actually um, oil inside this orbital arm and for pharmaceutical applications, that's sometimes not acceptable. Okay. Inside the orbital arm, there's different sealing mechanisms that are, that are possible. Uh, the general design is uh, lip seal. Uh, above that, there's single and double mechanical seals. Now the type of seal is gonna be determined by the application. So if you, if you just have a normal application, a lip seal is fine. If you want to pull pressure in the vessel, you would have to go for a mechanical seal. Uh, what a mechanical seal is, is that you have a stationary face and a rotating face, and the rotating face um, slides across the stationary face, and what that does is provide no gap for air or material to pass through. Um, so, you know, there's, there's different types of sealing mechanisms that are also possible within the unit. Um, Moving on, um, attached to the orbital arm, you have an auger. There's uh, two options for the auger as well. There's a solid flight and a flight that... Um, so you can see the solid flight over here. 
Um, the solid flight is uh, an auger and uh, the ribbon is connected directly to the shaft and it's a solid connection all the way up. Uh, what can happen in some applications, especially applications where you're doing a lot of cleaning or where you have moisture inside the batch, is that material can pack in this auger right into this gap in here. So to eliminate it, we also make this sanitary screw design. And the sanitary screw, what we do is we eliminate a lot of that weld and just put tabs that are connected working its way up the shaft. And that tab just reduces the amount of area that you could get material build up, makes it easier to clean. One thing to note, however, is that this um, auger has a lot of surface area and all that surface area is gonna be used to transport that material up from the bottom. In, these in uh, the sanitary design, what you have is you have holes, so you're not transporting as much material. You know, you have material that's, that should be being pushed up the batch, but instead it's falling back down through these openings. So you're going to get slightly less mixing capacity uh, in some of these applications for the sanitary design. Uh, we actually have a question uh, from um, one of the viewers, and that is, is this mixer good for uh, powder mixing, or is it possible to mix powders with abrasive grains? Um, it is possible to mix abrasive powders with these units. Um, they're a relatively low speed unit, so if you compare the speeds among different mixers, um, you're going to find that these mixers tend to mix, rel um, you know, they, they mix at a slower speed. What you're doing is you're taking, oh, let's go, let's see if we can find right here. What you're doing is you're, you're taking powder from one location to the other, and you're not really moving the entire batch at once. You know, you are taking that one portion and just placing it in the different places. Um, and be, because of that, um, you're not really doing too much really rapid, really abrasive mixing. Um, if, if you have an abrasive powder, there are some things that we would do though. And what we would do actually, if you go back to the mixing screw slide, what we would do is coat the screw. Um, sometimes this very edge of the auger can be um, abraded by an abrasive material. I mean, this is gonna be the portion where you have the most, um, the most speed, you know. Um, most of the speed is generated by the auger. So we can coat this edge with a wear resistant material and that wear resistant material uh, can help prevent um, abrasion over time. Um, in some extreme cases, we do provide a supported mixing screw. Um, if you look at that law, long cantilever auger, what can happen is it can deflect over the length of the mixer. So um, say you have a material that's very sticky or you have a very, very large mixer, say over 50 or 60,000 liters, um, even a little deflection over the length of that, of that auger can cause the auger to uh, impact the wall, which is something that you don't want to happen. So we, can, we would provide in those cases a support at the bottom of the auger. And what that support does is it basically ensures that the center of the auger stays centered in the mixer. So it's not really, we call it a supported auger, but it's really just a centering mechanism to ensure that the auger stays centered within the batch. Um, at the bottom of the mixer, you're going to have a discharge valve. Uh, one advantage to this type of mixer is that you can discharge directly out of the bottom and discharge the entire batch very easily. Um, this is a valve that we make, it's, it's called a ball segment valve. So what you have is basically a section of a ball and this section of the ball slides completely out of the way, giving you an, a fully open discharge uh, for um, to be able to discharge the entire batch very easily. Um, in cases where you have a supported auger, what you may need is you may need a side discharge and the side discharge um, we can do it in either a slide gate or a ball segment similar to that, um, but you would you would lose the advantages in the discharge, you know, of having that that uh, rapid, easy discharge. Um, I actually got another question about cleaning, and we're going to do some cleaning um, discussion at the very end. So um, just sit on that for a minute. Um, moving on, we'll talk about maintenance. Um, maintenance for these units. Um, the 
the most common piece of maintenance that you're going to have to do is check the lubricants. Um, there is oil within the orbital arm. Uh, to check the oil, you can check the, check the oil filling. On, uh, there's a dipstick on the on the orbital arm, and it's relatively simple to check. Um, above that, you you will have to periodically change the bearings and the seals inside the unit. Um, when you're planning out these things, um, these mixers, you want to make sure that you have enough space to remove the screw and the auger. Um, there are some things that you can do to make this simpler. Um, you know, you can lift out the entire bridge beam with the auger and the orbital attached. You can also remove pieces of the top cover to give yourself more space. So there are some things that, um, that you can do to make it easier. And um, we also have service personnel to help. Um, looking at the Nauta design for drying, um, you have a basic mixer, um, and that mixer um, is going to change into a dryer. So what you do is you add to the design. What you're going to add is you're going to add, um, and actually I got another question about scale up as well, and I'll mention that at the, maybe I'll talk about that at the end as well. Just give, give me another minute. Um, so what you do is you add a heating jacket. So when you're drying a uh, material, what you want to do is you want to take energy and you want to put it into the material and you want to use that energy to evaporate off the liquid. Um, that energy in this case is going to come from a, a welded half coil that's going to be added on. There's other types of jackets as well. Um, one advantage for these units is that you're going to be clean, clearing the wall with the auger. So the material is going to sit next to the wall. It's going to absorb some of that heat, and then it's going to be refreshed by the auger so you get fresh material there. Um, the other thing that, that we do is we add a vacuum filter. So this vacuum filter, it's a reverse pulse vacuum filter, similar to we use for um, dust collectors and things like that. And it's going to ensure that the material, as it's drying, stays inside the batch. So you're not going to get any of your, of your product leaving to the downstream systems. Um, vacuum dryers work as an entire system, so you have a vacuum dryer. You're also going to have a vacuum pump, which is going to provide the vacuum. Um, you're going to have a primary condenser, so you're going to have a solvent or water in some cases evaporating off. You want to collect that before your vacuum pump. You can also have secondary condensers, condensate receptacles, um, you know, general things that you're going to need for for your system. Uh, there's also controls and a heating cooling skid. So it's the the vacuum drying does not exist just as our unit itself. It, it has to be part of a complete unit. So you have to consider that, you know, besides just the dryer, you're going to need an entire system. Um, I might actually go into one of these questions, which is what parameters do you use to scale up from lab to production scale? So, um, scale. So what we would do is we have formulas that we can provide, and actually I didn't think of this question. It's very good though um, in advance, but um, what we would do is we have small lab units that we can test on, and then as long as the mix has the same parameters, so you are using the same, um, the same percentages, the same feedstocks, you want the same particle size as well. So um, let's go back to just this. So if you mix on the small scale and you mix to the large scale, what you're doing is the small scale mixers are kind of just a smaller version of the big mixer. So it is scalable. You just want to make sure that you have the same percentages. So if you go 5% and 95%, you want that to be in your, in your large as well. And once we generate a time, then there's a formula and you apply that formula and you can scale from the small to the large. Uh, there is a question about drying. Um, can the mixer be used to dry a slurry, uh, like a material that's partially soluble in a liquid? And the answer is yes. Um, there wouldn't be any changes um, going from that. You would basically just pump in the liquid into the dryer itself, and it would dry off and leave a powder. It makes no difference um, whether you are um, whether you're drying uh, a slurry, a cake. Um, a wet powder, you know, you add the mixer in, you, you add heat to that material, and then you use that heat to evaporate off the liquid. Uh, there's a question here about the um, uh, particle size limit. Um, the limit for these mixers is that you want the mixer, or you want the particle size to be smaller than the gap between the, between the auger and the orbital, or 
excuse me, the all the auger and the wall. So if you have, say, I would say normally, so for smaller vessels, you're going to get a smaller gap. Um, on the low end, you're probably talking about five to seven microns, something, or excuse me, five to seven millimeters, <laughs> excuse me, five to seven millimeters. So that's going to be your particle size. You probably want to be a millimeter or two below that. So, you know, you're talking about maybe three to five millimeters, maybe four, five, uh, four to six millimeters, something in that range. And that's going to be your, the upper end of your particle size. You know, there's not really an issue with particle size. You just don't want to kind of crush your material into the wall using the auger. You want it to be able to flow around that auger and to be moved up freely. Uh, I'm actually going to go on to um, some of our applications real quick, and then I'll hit the cleaning question, and then there's some other questions that are coming in as well. So one of the most common applications that we use this for is metal powders. So what you have is you have a powder that's very dense and very heavy, and you want to blend it with additives. Um, this tends to be for bulk densities over two and a half grams per milliliter. Um, and you're talking about batch weights, you know, in the, you know, five tons, 10 tons, 20 tons. And this, this mixer actually works really well for it. And it's kind of an interesting thing because when the mixer is mixing, the motor up top, this motor is actually driving this auger. And it's really only pulling material inside this red zone. So you're moving this material and the rest of this batch is actually sliding down by gravity. So it's sliding down, it's getting pulled in and the, and the mixer is pulling it up. So say you have a, met, a batch, you know, of, um, you know, 20 tons, you're really not moving. You're gonna mix that 20 ton batch of material, but at, at any time, you're only gonna be moving say 100 pounds or 200 pounds of that material because you're really only moving what's in the auger. And you're taking what's in that zone and you're moving it around the batch. So, you know, you can have a massive, massive batch of material, extremely heavy, and you can mix it just by mixing that one small portion at a time and sending it to different places inside the mixer. So it's interesting because it's it's a situation where where the, the uniqueness of the design really comes out and, and is advantageous. Um, another application is catalysts. Um, you can do a coating and drying of a catalyst in a single vessel. What you can do is we can spray in liquids inside the batch um, and you're spraying it in while you're mixing so you can get a nice even coating of your catalyst and then you can evaporate off the carrier fluid leaving a dried catalyst behind. The other thing is that I mentioned is this is a gentle mixer so you are going to get uh, less abrasion than you might with other methods. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a single, single batch coating vessel. Um, one of the final ones is pectin blending. So for pectin, what you have is you have, um, it's a polysaccharide and it comes from, I believe, orange peels and apple pomace are two of the, two of the most common uh, feedstocks. And what you want is you want a gentle blender that's not going to generate heat. Um, any heat into this natural product and you can form black spots or dirty spots or, you know, you can make the product, this is going to be used in food things. So, you know, you really, you don't want to deform or change the product at all. You don't want to put too much heat in, too much energy. And this, this mixer tends to work really well because you can have a big batch of material and you can mix it and you can mix it gently and, and not have any material that's going to be, you know, sent out of spec. Um, there were some questions about cleaning, and I'm going to jump out and try to pull up some pictures that I set aside for cleaning. So for cleaning these units, let's see if I can pull this over here. Give me one quick. Okay, let's see here. So for cleaning these units, you'll notice here that this includes the semi-domed cover. So that's what we were talking about. Um, previously in the top cover. So for cleaning, what you do is you send liquid down the center shaft and you send it out to cleaning devices that are gonna clean the vessel. Now there's different components with inside, inside the vessel that are gonna have to be cleaned. So for these, in, in general, what you do is you clean from the top down. So there is, let's see here, I'm gonna jump around real quick. There's, there's, going to be nozzles that are going to clean the top of the orbital arm. So you, 
you're going to have dust inside your batch, and that dust is going to going to swirl around as you mix. You know, there's just a little bit that gets lifted up at the top. You know, and that little bit is going to settle on the surfaces, so you can get you can get dust that builds up on this top surface of the orbital arm. So what we can do is we can put nozzles in the top cover, and those nozzles are going to spray either air or liquid and clean this top or top of the orbital arm off. Uh, inside the vessel itself, you can have nozzles inside the vessel to clean the auger. So if there's going to be material that's built up inside the auger, you could put nozzles, and those nozzles are going to spray directly onto the auger and um, clean the surface of the auger from any material that's going to be built up. For the vessel itself, that was the first slide I showed you, and you're going to have two components. You're going to try to clean the inside of the mixer. So that this is a, um, a rotary head. Um, that we buy out from a, uh, another vendor, and it is driven by water pressure. So the head rotates, and then the nozzles on the head rotate, and it's a tank cleaning device, and it's going to spray the inside of the the inside of the complete vessel with uh, cleaning fluid. You know, it kind of sends out jets of cleaning fluid that stripe the walls, and they remove any buildup material. Um, and this is actually going to going to be rotating with the orbital arm. So you would turn on the orbital arm turn on this jet and it's going to spin around while the orbital arm is spinning, cleaning the entire inside. Uh, besides that, you want to clean the top cover of the vessel as well. So you're going to have this side arm that comes out and this is uh, more of a standard spray ball. And this standard spray ball is going to clean um, the top side of the vessel and this corner section in here. Um, let's see, we've got some other questions coming through. Um, Let's see here. Uh, there's a question about active freeze drying. Um, you can do freeze drying for these mixers. It's not common. Um, there's some um, some applications where instead of taking the the material from a liquid to a vapor, what you do is you turn it from you add it to the mixer and you turn it into a solid. So you freeze it and then you uh, you turn the, um, the, the material from a solid into a vapor. And what that does is it helps maintain the volume of the material that's dissolved within the liquid. So if you imagine drying of water out of a cup, you're going to continuously reduce the volume in that cup until you have just a speck of material at the bottom, you know, whatever was dissolved in that liquid. If you freeze dry it, what you do is you generate that volume that you initially have. So let's say you have, you know, 10 milliliters. When you come back after freeze drying, you can have, you know, whatever was dissolved in there spread out amongst those 10 milliliters, you know, if you have enough solid dissolved, of course, you know, spread out amongst those 10 milliliters. And, you know, that's really good for a lot of pharmaceutical applications, and it can be done inside these mixers. Um, it's not super common. Uh, I myself am in the chemicals, minerals, metals de department, and, you know, this is really sold strictly into the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical realm. Um, is there any experience drying of grains and seeds? There is some experience. Um, you know, what you want to do is you want to make sure that the, the grain is below the particle size of the gap. So you want to make sure that you're not crushing it within that gap. But as long as you're not crushing it within that gap, there shouldn't be any issue, you know, drying of the grains and seeds. I do know that they use it for a lot of spice applications as well. So blending of spices, things where you want to kind of make sure that you're not um, distorting your particle size or breaking your product. Uh, is there a viscosity limit for mixing a slurry? There is. Um, what you want to make sure when you're mixing a slurry is that you're not dragging it through. So if you look at the auger, Excuse me. Um, actually, I'll just use this right here. If you look at the auger, what you want to make sure is that the auger is picking material up from the bottom and transporting it. If you have a if you have a material that's very viscous, what it can do is it can cake. You're not going to get any transport from the auger. What you're going to get is you're going to get material that just kind of forms a cylinder around the auger, packs in there, and then you have no transport. You need to make sure that you have transport within these these mixers to make sure that they're working together. If the material is too viscous and you have no transport, um, then you're not going to get any any mixing inside the batch, and you're also not going to get any of that transport that's kind of freeing the path for the auger. So there is an upper limit, and we actually 
um, do have some values on that. I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's something that I can definitely send you. Um, let's see. Um, how do you determine how long to mix the material to achieve fully homogeneous powder? That's a very good question. And what we can do is we can sample the mixer. Um, you can pull samples out and you can grab random. There's a ways of, oh, actually, let's pull back up the presentation. I'm talking to a, uh, a blank screen. Let's go back to the presentation real quick. And then I can, oh, give me just one second here. We're dealing with some some technical back and forth. We're going to pull back up the presentation. Oh, sorry, that was a question. Let's pull that back over. And we're going to pull up the question. And these are great questions, by the way. Keep them coming because uh, some of these things I probably should have thought of. Um, but I'll just speak while we deal this with. How do you determine how long to mix a material to achieve full, fully homogeneous powder? What you can do is we can make estimates in advance based on how difficult of a mixture it seems um, how difficult of a mixture it is. So whether you have, you know, if you imagine it's much easier to mix a 50-50 blend than it is to mix a 99 to 1% blend. So we're just going to leave this slide back up there and, and it'll be fine. Um, so it's, we can make estimates based on that going in advance. And then we have small mixers and we can mix trial batches for you. And then um, you can take random sample uh, sampling from that trial batch and determine if you're homogeneous or not. Um, a lot of times we rely on the customer to help us determine uniformity because it can be hard to tell. For instance, say you have two white powders, you know, how would you determine that those two white powders are fully mixed? You can look at that batch right away and say, oh, you know, you start with two white powders and in the end you have two white powders. So, you know, um, we have some time estimates that we use, but a lot of times the sampling um, the determination itself actually comes with us working with the end user to determine um, that we have reached the mixing quality that's going to be required. Um, is, the, is the product suitable for explosive powders? It is. Um, it needs to be considered in advance. Um, you have to make some changes for it. I mean, this is a slow mixing or a slow speed mixer, so it's not it's not going to be, you know, generating a dust cloud, for instance. You know, you have a very gentle mixer, very slow speed, but you do need to consider it. Um, you know, you can um, inert the mixer is basically the easiest way to do it. You know, you add nitrogen into the batch. Um, you make sure that that you have an inert atmosphere. Um, it's it's one of those things where a lot of times you're going to get a spark from somewhere else in your batch, and that spark is going to carry over into the mixer. And then you just want to make sure that you um, don't have an atmosphere inside this large vessel where you can get a dust explosion. So, you know, it can handle an explosive powder. Um, you just kind of have to make sure. I guess as an as an an added thing, one thing to consider, you can also add an explosion vent. Um, it is um, not super common, but you know, we have enough surface area. You put the explosion vent on the top cover and um, you know, you can vent the explosion that way. Um, in the same vein, there's a question, are there any limits on electrical classifications? There's not, um, you know, you can do this, um, you know, in class one, class two, um, div one, div two, you know, there's really not an issue. Um, Let's see here. Does the cleaning arm rem remain in the vessel during the mixing? Uh, yes. Um, you actually are going to move the cleaning arm though to make sure that you mix the mix the uh, the batch or you know that you clean. So if you move the auger, you can then clean the area of the wall where the auger was. So you are going to do it, and that way you can have a nice quick changeover. You know, it takes some time to take out the orbital arm. If you just clean the batch with the auger and the orbital arm in place, it's it's much easier. And you know, you can you can do it with the machine running, and it's um, it's not an issue. Uh, can we add mechanical heat as well as using the vacuum drying, for instance, introducing warm air? Um, you can. Um, it it would be more difficult. Um, you know, there are some cases where, for instance, you can percolate air up through the bottom, um, but it's it's much less common. Um, usually if you're gonna add add heat, you add it through the wall. You know, this is it's more common to be used as an indirect dryer 
adding warm air is something that's more common for like a spray dryer or a flash dryer um, where, you know, this is, is um, more of an indirect dryer. Um, you know, you, you can, and I don't see any issues with it, but, you know, if you were, for instance, to, to spray air through the bottom, um, you, you might be able to get a marginal improvement. It's just not very common. Um, no, I think we're good. Uh, there is a question how they compare to a ribbon blender. Um, what applications do better uh, in the Nauta Mixer and what applications would not do as well? Um, compared to the ribbon blender, the ribbon blender is a good blender. Um, it's a horizontal blender if you're not familiar with it and it's got a ribbon and, and you can get a good mix quality. Um, the advantage of the Nauta is really comes in with its shape. Um, you can get a, a quick and easy discharge with the Nauta mixer. So, for instance, you open the bottom valve of the mixer and all the material is going to discharge out very freely and very easily. Um, you're going to get minimal holdup. Um, the ribbon blender, you're going to have less height. So that, that could be one advantage of the ribbon blender where this is a vertical blender. That's a horizontal blender. So you're going to have less height. You know, they're both going to provide a good mix of quality. But, um, you know, this one is um, taller and it's gonna give you better discharge, probably. Uh, there are some modifications they can make um, as well, uh, but you know, you're gonna get good discharge where that's not gonna be as tall, but you may have more, uh, more difficult discharge. Um, uh, there is a, there's some other questions that I'm skipping that are more um, very specific. Um, and maybe what I'll do is email you answers to some of those more specific questions. Um, I think we're at our time limit. Um, we're starting to see people drop off. So, you know, if you have any additional questions, feel free to send them in and I'll, I'll email you or call you. It's not an issue. And um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, at this time, we are going to conclude the webinar, but the program has been recorded today and we will post the recording to our website in the next 24 hours. And as Chris mentioned, we did receive a ton of questions here. Some of them require a much longer response. Uh, so Chris or one of his colleagues will be answering you shortly offline. Uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us today, and we hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, hope to see you again soon. Thank you.